Okay, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the presentation this afternoon with uh, our special guests. And this is Active Aging Week. So hopefully um, you have your schedule at home of uh, all of the activities this week and that you plan to come to as many as you can. Um, just a, a recap, um, Wednesday, um, we have a special movie tomorrow. Uh, Wednesday is our Crazy Hat Walk um, at um, 8.30 at the Crossing Circle. Um, so um, there's donuts afterwards from Oregon Dairy. Um, and then Thursday, we have an open house event for the Aquatic Center. And then there's a special sunset picnic at the Pinnacle bus trip. Um, and then um, Friday, don't miss our end of week country fair carnival at the auditorium at 1.30 um, on Friday to end the week. Um, so we have a lot of fun things planned. So real quick, um, Jim and Kathy, I met them um, this year at, um, at, at the uh, Lan Lancaster County Senior Games. Um, so we just struck up a conversation and oftentimes that's how friendships and acquaintance and things start up just by um, just talking. So um, we had a great talk and I learned um, some fun things about them and some interesting things and um, their travels were just so interesting. And so I invited them um, to be our special guest speaker um, to kick off Active Aging Week. If you remember last year this time, we had a through hiker of the Appalachian Trail, Keith Forsyth, um, come and speak to us about his adventures. Well, Kathy and Jim have uh, sort of an adventure of, the, of, their, of their own. I have a little cliff notes to introduce them and I'm gonna turn it over to them. So not to steal the thunder, and I was told never to reveal a woman's age or ask them how old they are, um, but um, Kathy can do that herself. Um, so about close to 15, 20 years ago, Kathy was diagnosed with um, the dreaded C word, um, cancer. And um, so it was a year after her treatment that she started thinking and preparing herself both physically and mentally uh, to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the world's tallest freestanding mountain. This is the second time that she would have climbed the mountain. That was just 12 months after having undergone serious chemotherapy treatment. Um, so um, she prepared herself by exercising with um, the elliptical machine, stationary bike, and the summit trainer, all equipment that we have in our own fitness center. So, um, so it's just a little uh, plug to come and visit us in the fitness center. I'm convinced that active aging um, is the, s the secret to longevity and quality of life is being active. And being active can, be, can mean different things to different people. Just reading a book is keeping your mind active. So um, I would encourage you um, to continue leading a, a, a healthy, active lifestyle as we continue to old age. Um, and we get older by the day, so um, all of us. So um, there's a couple quotes um, before I hand it over. I love this quote um, from Kathy's doctor. Um, she's simply amazing and an inspiration to other women facing this disease. She's living proof that you can go on to live a full, healthy, and active life. Another quote from Kathy herself, I feel as though I've been preparing for this, maybe not physically, but mentally ever since the diagnosis. I felt very strongly about wanting to do my best, whether that meant I actually made it to the top or not. So I think that's important to kind of be flexible with your own goals and it's the process, it's the, the, the just doing things, doing something, that being active um, can be its goal in and of itself. And then a quote from Kathy's husband, Jim. Since the future is not predictable, we have learned to live for the moment. 
this is one of those moments that will last forever. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Kathy and Jim. Thank you, Todd. Well, thank you, Todd. I appreciate those comments. Uh, to take the load off of your mind, I'm 93 and Kathy is 84. So that takes care of that. <laughs> Kathy and I both love to travel. Uh, we've traveled in our professions. Uh, I retired uh, back in 88, and we've, re we've hit uh, 42 different countries so far. The one we're going to talk about today and, and review for you is East Africa. And if all of the places that we've been to, East Africa is our favorite, and I think uh, we almost count it as a second home. Not that we live there, but we feel that way when we get there. Uh, we, the first time we went to East Africa, we weren't prepared intellectually for what was there. We had talked to some people, read some magazines, and uh, went on over. And we found out an awful lot about the, the country, the people, and that's what we're going to share with you today. Uh, questions that you may have, please hold them till the end. We've got plenty of time, and we'll be glad to review anything, anything in the artifacts in the back that you'd like to know about, we can take care of. <clears throat> this first slide shows how big Africa is. The black line is the outline of Africa, and you'll see in there that we have India, we have U.S., we have China, we have Germany, and many of the European countries, all within the boundary of East Africa. It's huge. Yes. If you take the length of East Africa, it's 7,000 miles. Africa. Our width here in the United States is a little over, what, 2,000-something. So this is about three and a half times the size of the U.S., and all of those other countries are right there beside us, which at times causes problems because there's uh, animosity between some of these country, countries there that are not mentioned in this slide, but we'll, go, we'll talk about it. Uh, the average age expectancy in East Africa for the native is 45 to 53 years of age. The, the, I don't know how to put it, but the, the workings of a native family depend entirely or mostly on the wife. The female handles a lot of the political uh, ends of the, of the uh, uh, marriage, hands a lot of the working on, on the farm to the wife, and you'll see that as we go, we go on. Today, I'd like to give the microphone to, to Kathy. She has done something that not too many people have ever thought about doing. And at her age and uh, health problems way back, it's amazing. And I'm very, very proud of her. So Kathy, I'll give you the microphone. Okay. Wait a minute, I'll tell you what. Let me do one thing. Okay. One thing. I wanted to show you that. There are 1.3 billion people in, a, uh, in Africa. Now that was before HIV, it was before the pandemic, and it was before the bad droughts that we've had in the last couple of years. I would assume that we're probably uh, 1.2, 1.1 1 .1 billion people now. And uh, you can see the, the distance between uh, uh, LA and, and New York versus the width and heights of the uh, East Africa. This is an amazing slide. There are over 2,000 languages, 2,000 languages that are spoken in East Africa, or in Africa totally. A lot of them are accents, a lot of them are dialects, but they're all slightly different. Uh, we have 3,000 ethnic groups you may have three or four ethnic groups within the same native village. Uh, but certainly within a village, you'll have Swahili spoken, 
you'll have English spoken to a certain degree, and you'll have Ma, M-A-A, which is a, uh, one, of one of the languages spoken within the village, too. There you go. Okay. Okay. If you give me just a minute, I'm going to switch. Hmm? Switch presentations. What's that? There we go. Right. There we are. Finally get to see Killy. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you say Jombo for me, please? Oh, say it like you mean it. Jombo. That's Swahili for hello. How are you? What's up? What's new? And people are very friendly within any very small village or even some of the smaller cities. You, you always say Jombo to somebody when you pass them on the street. It's a polite thing to do, and people still do that there. So anyway, Jombo, everyone, and welcome to going up the highest freestanding mountain in the world. As you all know, Everest is the highest mountain in the world at 29,000 feet, and Kilimanjaro is just 10,000 feet lower than that. Now, the reason it's called the highest freestanding mountain in the world is that it's an extinct volcano. If you are on the Serengeti Plain, which runs between Tanzania and Kenya, you will see Kilimanjaro from miles away. It's quite overpowering because it is so tall and you are just on a flat plain. So you, you really get to see it quite a ways away. So where is it anyway? Well, it's actually, if you can see there on the left-hand side, over here, right there, there's Tanzania. It's about part way down uh, the, the uh, coast there. And it is part of East Africa. Africa is actually dry, uh, up. It is divided into regions. And the regions are North Africa, East Africa, South Africa, West Africa. There's one more, and I can't remember what it is, but it's huge, and they do divide it into regions. So there you can see where it is. And Kilimanjaro is actually made up of three mountains. Uh, there were three volcanoes there. One uh, is Kibo, which is the highest one, and that's the one that I'm going to be going up. Uh, you can see Shira on the left-hand side, and I'll tell you a little bit about what happened here with uh, Kibo and Shira, and then there's Moenzi over here. So those are the three. Now what happened was that Kibo, right here, actually broke its rim. And I want to show you where that is. There's Moenzi over there. You can't see Shira because it's a plateau now that sits below that would be right, right where my back is. And here you can see, see the crater edge there? Well, it broke right there. And that's called the Western Breach. Now, there's all kinds of ways you can climb up Kilimanjaro. There are lots of different ways. Some of them are harder than others. And I wanted to challenge myself. And so I said, OK, fine. I want to do what's called a scramble. Now, a scramble is using only your hands and your feet. It's not like somebody's a rock climber. It's not like that, because that's a little different and far more challenging and, to me, a little bit crazy. But, well, I don't know. My oncologist even said I was crazy, so what are you going to do? Anyway, um, there were parts of this that were hand over foot. Um, you had to find your footing and your hands, where you put your hands and where you put your feet. But not the whole way, because as you went up the Shira Plateau, it is a plateau. It is still difficult to go up, but it is not hand over foot. Now, if you have a good guide and a good outfitter, they will take with them what's called a hyperbaric bag. You may be familiar with them when, it, when you're talking about divers. When people get the bends, 
they have a hyperbaric bag that they put you into to, to pressurize it to make sure that the nitrogen isn't trying to boil out of your body. And so it, it keeps the person from dying of the bends. Well, on, on a mountain, it's just the opposite. You want to make sure that the person is at an altitude that is going to save them. So you have to, you have to differentiate between the two. And if you have a good outfitter, they'll have one for safety purposes. So what's the reason for problems on Kilimanjaro? Well, here they are. Abrupt altitude change, dehydration, cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, and the weather. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Let me just talk about this. This is going over a map of how we're going to climb. This is the gentleman that I had for both of the climbs. His name is Victor Kenyanga. I'm still in contact with him. And uh, he has been up probably over 200 times now. Here, he was 38 at that point, so uh, he's uh, close to 50 now. He explains what we're going to do and that there's going to be a hard day and an easy day. Well, what's a hard day? Six to eight hours of climbing. An easy day is four. So you go a hard day the first day, an easy day the second day, etc. Except for the last day, which is even longer. The other thing that Victor did was he made me pull out every single piece of clothing that I was taking. Don't you like my fashion statement here, by the way? <laughs> you got to have gaiters. There are too many insects and stuff that are, and ants that are going to crawl up your legs if you don't have gaiters on. And everybody wears gaiters. It's just an absolute necessity. The boots I have are for going down. They also work going up, but they're specially built for going down. And if any of you have been hikers, you know that going down can be harder than going up. So anyway, he looked at all of my clothing, my underwear, for heaven's sakes, everything. Cotton kills. You are not allowed to take anything cotton up Kilimanjaro. People do go up in jeans, but they shouldn't. That does not keep you warm. Not only that, denim doesn't breathe. You need materials that are going to breathe. You need silk or wool or the new poly, uh, polypropylene types of material that um, you can take with you. So. All of my clothing was either silk or polypropylene. And I had one piece of equipment that he did let me take. It's a sweatshirt. It's in the back. Uh, it was half polypropylene, half cotton. And he did let me take that. But he said I, he wasn't too happy about it. But he said, I know that's your only sweatshirt. You can take that. Here we are going up. Um, on the way up, we're at about 5,000 feet when you start, uh, and we go in. There are several gates to go in. You can't just go in and climb. You have to ha be registered. They have to know exactly which camps you're going to go to. You have to check in and out of each camp as you go so that they know that you're safe and that you are going where you're supposed to go. Years ago, outfitters took advantage of the porters. You're only supposed to carry 75 pounds. They were, what the outfitters were doing was, OK, they weighed 75 pounds at the front gate. When they got to the first camp, what they would do is they would unload one or two of the porters and give all that weight to some of the other porters. That way, they saved money, and they overloaded the porters. Well, of course, the Kenyan government caught on to that and said, you're not doing this anymore. You have to weigh in and weigh out at each camp. So they've stopped doing that, thank goodness, because it really was not fair to the porters. They are paid between, I would say now, probably 8 and $12 a day to uh, be a porter. So let me explain about dehydration. On this particular slide here, you will see this one says, number seven says, drink. Four to five liters of any kind of fluid a day. Well, actually, it's more than that. It's six to eight liters. Now, that's a quart. 
okay, in our terms, a day. And this is how you do it. You drink a quart for breakfast, you drink a quart in the morning, you drink a quart at lunch, you drink a quart in the afternoon, you drink a quart at the evening meal, and you drink a quart during the night. And that's how you get all the fluid in. And if you don't, you'll get dehydrated. Now, you don't sweat. The problem is it's extremely dry on Kilimanjaro. You lose it through your lungs. And that's where the vapor's going. It's not through your sweat. You will find you're not sweating at all because it's extremely dry. On one of the trips that we went, uh, this is, I think, the second one, the second climb. It had, uh, the rainy season had extended more than anybody thought it would. And we're, this is trying to get to the Londorossi Gate. And you can see that if we try to go any farther, we're going to bottom out on this piece right here because the, the lorry's not going to be able to go over that. So we're about, I'd say, maybe half a mile to three quarters of a mile from the gate. So we had to unload all the equipment and all the gear and had to uh, carry it up to the gate. But when we were um, actually at this point, right in front of us, it had been so bad, so slippery, that when this particular lorry tried to go up the same hill we were trying to go up there, that when he tried to come back down because he was sliding so much, he actually slid over the edge, and he was down in this a little canyon here. Um, and we don't know whether anybody was hurt, but it did turn over. So you can see how treacherous it was even just to get there. So here we are at the trailhead. Now, those of you who aren't hikers, the trailhead's just the beginning of the trail. And you wonder what all these people are doing there. Because the arrangements have already been made for all the porters who are going to take any group. And this is actually, <laughs> this is actually at the Western Breach, which most people don't use because it's treacherous. Matter of fact, they've had it closed for a couple of years because they had a lot of landslides there that killed people. But I was going up the Western Breach. I wanted to go challenge myself. So anyway, what happened here is these are people who have come from all over in case some porter doesn't show up. And a lot of times, one or two porters in a group may not show up. Maybe they've got a sickness in the family. They have their own farms and homes to take care of, and maybe they just can't make it. Uh, there may be a birth in the family. There's all kinds of reasons why they may not show up. And so these fellows come and wait to see uh, if they might get a job. And that's why they're there. This is our chef's backpack. Notice his egg crates. We had fresh food up until about 14,000 feet. After that, it really it was powdered food, or uh, but some of it wasn't too. So we had some very good food. And by the way, you have to eat. But when you get up to altitude, what happens is anybody who has a weight problem will love this. You don't want to eat when you get up to altitude. It took me about 30 to 40 minutes on the Western Breach at lunch one day to eat, you know one of those tiny little muffins, you know the tiny little guys? Two of those and a piece of cheese. Took me 45 minutes to get that down. And of course, that's not even enough food to really put in you for lunch. But that's all I could get down that day. Now, when you start out on this six to, well, it was six to eight hours this first day, we're in what's called the Montane Forest. There's practically every climate on Kilimanjaro that exists in the world. But all it means is mountain forest. It's actually a rainforest, just like you would think of you know, for South America or something like that. It's a rainforest. Well, there are animals in the rainforest, and you notice this gentleman's carrying a single-shot rifle. Well, he can take down most anything that would really want to hurt us with a single shot. He's very well trained. But look how he's dressed. Now, it's about 65 degrees. 70 degrees. We're not at altitude yet. And I'm kind of dressed like this, except I will tell you something about my clothing in a little bit. Anyway, that's all he owns. And he's cold. He's used to it being 90 at, or 85 when they live down on the, on the plain. So he is, he's just carrying all his stuff on his back because he's cold. <laughs> but I found that interesting. By the way, they told us that we needed to have a rifle with us till noon the second day. 
I said, what's so special about noon the second day? And I'll show you why, that's, why that is, because we have to go through the montane forest. And as we go, he's protecting us against these animals, warthogs. Cape buffalo, which are the nastiest things you can possibly imagine, they will charge you for no reason. Lions and elephants. In all the times we went to Africa, the only dangerous times we've been in were always with elephants. So just a quick overview here of, of the climate. Um, beginning at the Londa Rossi Gate, we start at about 5,000 feet into the montane forest. And you can see the picture there. It's a regular old rainforest. Lots of waterfalls, a lot of water coming down everywhere. And at 9,800 feet, we go across the Shira Plateau. Once we get out of the montane forest, we start across the Shira Plateau. And we won't do that. We'll be doing that exactly at noon on the second day. And I'll show you how you know that. After that, at, uh, the Alpine Desert starts, and that goes through 16,500 feet. And from there on up, uh, we go through the land of the giant Senecios, and I'll show you those. Those are very strange-looking plants. And uh, after that, nothing grows. And the summit area has no vegetation and runs from about 16,000 on up to uh, the 19,000 feet. OK, this is the waterproof bag. Now, take a look at that. Into this went my gear. OK, now my gear consisted of the clothing that I had to take. And you can see that at the back. Um, I was going to talk about clothing. I have some jewelry on today. You're not allowed to have any jewelry at all on, not even your wedding ring. The problem of frostbite becomes a situation. And so you don't want any metal up against your body at all. The other thing is that, as I told you, you know, he went through all of my clothing to make sure everything was OK. But I want to tell you a little bit about it. And you'll see examples in the back. You wear silk on the, on the bottom. That's silk. You have a silk top and silk pants. On top of that is fleece. On top of that is going to be wind pants and a, another jacket of some kind. That's what I would have on my sweatshirt. Uh, and on top of that goes a very heavy jacket. And on top of that goes rain pants and a rain jacket. So you have a lot of clothing. I'm carrying most of it on my back, along with the water I need for that day. And the reason for that is that Kilimanjaro makes its own weather. And it is totally unpredictable. In 15 minutes, it can drop 30 to 40 degrees. And you have to be watching all the time. And of course, our guide is. And he can tell you. Uh, go put on X, Y, Z. He'll tell you what to put on, because in 15 minutes, we're going to be having rain, or we're going to have a snow, or whatever, sleep. So he knows, and he can tell you that. And so you stop, and you put on whatever you need. What happened is here, here's all my stuff. It went in this bag. And then after my gear goes in, it weighs about 25 pounds. That's my, not the tent. But it's my uh, sleeping bag, my sleeping mat, and anything else that I don't carry on my back. And then finally, what he's going to put in there is his own stuff. And then he's going to put in maybe some kitchen equipment or you know, a piece of camp gear of some kind. And then he picks that up and he puts it on his head and carries it. Here is Victor and I, and we are just in the montane forest there. I'd already told you, he's been on the mountain about, well, probably 35 years now, and he's sent it close to 200 times. And there's my home away from home. I had my own little tent there, and you can see right here there's a little vestibule. Take a look at the ground around here. You really can't see it, but it's extremely muddy. And what you don't want to do is take the mud into the tent with you, so you take your boots off in that little vestibule, and you leave them there. Well. Kenya was a British colony. And I'm busy sitting there, uh, kind of outside my tent a little bit, trying to clean the mud off my boots. Because it actually clumps on there so much that you're picking up more weight, I mean, and you need to get rid of it. Well, one of the porters comes along, and he looks at me. You know, he's standing up here and kind of looking down, kind of down his nose at me. He said, Madam, give me your boots. 
And I said, it's okay, I can clean them. Madam, that is my job, give me your boots. It's the British way of doing things. You didn't do things for yourself. You know, the British always did things in a very upscale and, up, and a classic, classy way. And so that still exists within the porter's mentality today. They want to do everything for you. They will bring you your coffee or your tea in your tent in the morning. I mean, that's the kind of thing that they want to do for you. Well, we're at noon of the second day, and notice where we are. We're not in the, mount we're not in the rainforest anymore, so we don't need our riflemen anymore. So he turns around and goes back. And it is actually at noon of the second day. It's amazing. Um, what happens is that the, the length of this room, the climates change very quickly. If you just look at the distance in this room, I could be standing in the montane forest here, and I got to the other side of the room, and I'm now over where the uh, giant senecios are, or the giant heather is, excuse me, this giant heather. Totally different climate. And here we are crossing a stream in the land of the giant heather. And you can see the heather there. It's pretty tall. It gets to be 20, 25 feet high. And we have a lot of water. And you might wonder where we get all this water we drink. Well, they say you can drink the water coming right off Kilimanjaro, but nobody does. Um, you know, you could still get things. I don't know what they would call it there, but we would call it beaver fever here. Um, and we boil all of our water before we use it. When we can't boil the water, we do use um, tablets, but uh, they don't you don't have to do that much anymore because you have little filters that you can carry. It's on, I have it back there. It's only about this big, and I can make enough water for myself that's pure for a day with that little piece of equipment. So everybody carries one just in case. Here he is picking up. See, he's just getting the water in one of those big cans. And here's how we do the water purifying. They have a big one so that they put it in count, you know, these five-gallon cans. And all they do is go pick up all that water, you know, in those huge, like, gasoline cans, and then they put it through a purifier. But what happened one time was, because it gets so cold at night, the purifier froze. So they tried to put hot water through it, and they ruined it. So, you know, that, at that point, everybody had to use their little purifier until they could go get somebody to run down the mountain and get another one. And they do do that. If, if they're up at 10,000, 12,000 feet, they literally will run down the mountain and run back up. These are people that live there. They've got double the amount of uh, red blood cells in them that you actually accumulate as you're going up. And that's, uh, that's a problem because people try to rush. And if you do that, you have the cause then of dehydrating yourself, which one of my climbing mates did, um, or you run into a problem of cerebral edema um, or pulmonary edema, and then they have to take you off the mountain. So you have to listen to your porters and your guides. And there's a term in Swahili. It's called pole, pole. Let me show you what it means at altitude. You can't breathe, but this is what you do. You take a step, take a breath, take a step, let it out. And that's about how slow you're going. A step, and then another step. This picture shows well the relative size of the bag that I was talking about to my, my porter the first time. His name is Justin. And he was 6'6", six, six, so you can see how big the bag is. And there, there they are carrying it on. This, this is before um, Kenya um, ruled out, caught all these um, outfitters of just loading these porters up, and you can see what they're carrying. It's strictly illegal. So there's a typical one there. This is. We're looking back over the Shira Plateau. That's that place where the, where the volcano broke and all the lava flowed down one side and became a, kind of a plateau. It's, that's a misnomer. It truly isn't a plateau. It's not flat. On the second climb, second time I went up, we had terrible wind. And 
usually what would happen is there'd be a little tent where you sit outside even at lunchtime. They'd put up a little tent for you to when you stop for lunch. And we couldn't even do that because the wind just blew it right down. So we had a pretty hard time. Um, up to 60 mile an hour winds, which is about all I can stand up in. Um, and uh, there are, I'll tell you more about that one as we go. This is day two. We are in a, a camp on Shira. You can see what's happened now to the vegetation. It's not tall now at all. It's getting smaller and smaller. And the heather is just about at ground level now. And that's what it looks like in the morning. And what happens with Kilimanjaro is if you're not there in the morning or the, or the evening, it's enshrouded in clouds. But this was a particularly not too bad morning, and I could get a picture. But you can see the clouds are just starting to come down. And by the way, you may think my pictures are grainy, but they're not. There's a mist in the air all the time. And so it makes your pictures look as though they're kind of grainy, that they're not in focus. I wanted you to see these giant senecios. Aren't they strange looking things? Let me explain. At the top, you can see they're green. But as, if, as they die, they actually insulate the stalk so the water that's inside of them doesn't freeze at night. And these can get to be 30 feet high or so. You can see it's fairly high here. But they're weird looking plants, let me tell you. And there's a whole forest of them that you go through. Here's some more of them just to show you. It's called the moorland. OK, to get some idea of what we're looking at here, I'm looking at, we're going toward a place called Moor Hut. Now, Right, let me see if I can find it. There's a person with a red hat or a back or some back, a backpack or something right about in this area. And that you can barely see the person, but this gives you an idea. Here's a climber right here. You can see then the perspective. This is the elephants come. Even up this high, they come up to 13 or 14,000 feet. There are minerals there that elephants need. And I took a picture of this because it's an elephant skull, so that it could I could prove that there really are elephants that go up that, that far. What you see in the back is called Lava Tower. It's just a remnant of the volcano itself, sheer volcano. And um, again, you can see a couple people right down in here, if you look carefully. Um, sometimes when we get to a camp, we camp up along here. And some people go and climb this just to, be, um, to go up a little bit farther. Sometimes they'd have you do that, and then you come back down. It's to help you acclimate. And then some mornings, as we got higher, it looked like this. Um, what did I do with it? Oh, well, it's not here. Yes, it is. I'm going to pass it around. Kilimanjaro is so dry that snow doesn't melt. It evaporates. It's called subliming. It evaporates before it even hits the ground. So although it might have snowed all night, look what little bits left on the ground. So I wanted to show you. This is just polyethylene, uh, but this is what the snow looks like. You can pass that around if you want. It, it really is very strange. It, it's very grainy and just little pellet-like. And it, it, maybe within an hour, even that will sublime and you won't see any snow. So it takes quite a bit of snow for it to even stay there. By the way, what's in the back? Right up here. When you climb or when you hike, those of you who you have been hikers, you know that you're supposed to bury your human waste. Well, Kilimanjaro was getting so bad that the National Park said, you can't do that anymore. You must carry a chemical toilet. So along with everything else they carry, there's a chemical toilet in the back. It was purple and yellow, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. And you can see it's pretty cold there. I would say probably that night it might have been down about 25. And here we got to 
where we were really going to make it up into the crater. Now, I wanted, remember I showed you where that crater broke? And we're going up the western breach. Well, this is the day that we're going to actually go up that slope where the lava came down. It's hand over foot. Why is it doing that? Sorry, I'm going to move this. Can you all hear me? No. You can't hear me unless I do that. If they have it just a little loud, and what's happening is when I move around, it, it rumbles in the background. I was trying to get it to stop that. Can you all hear me? OK. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Voice carries pretty well, but I still like a microphone. You can see here where we're going to go. You see where that one little bit of snow is right here? We're going to go up in the middle of that. So the picture was taken, and the gentleman that I said had dehydrated himself, which he did on this day, he took the picture and he said, don't you want to look at it, Kathy? And I said, no, I'm afraid if I look at it, I won't go there. <laughs> so anyway, during that day is when we did the hand over foot, and off we went. And I can show you that again. See, here, here we're, we're going up this. And you can see how steep it is. The only way you're going to get it is to put a foot down, get a handhold, find another foothold, find another handhold. You can see where it broke right here. We're going camping right about there. We're going to set up our camp there. Here is the crater, actually, itself. The ash pit, they call it. And this is actually what is called Uhuru Peak. It is the tallest part of the mountain. And after we camp here overnight, then we climb up here to the peak. And then we go down the other side. So here we are, camped in the crater. Um, this is called the Furt Wongler Glacier. I don't even know if it's still there. It was melting pretty rapidly even when I was there. You can see our, excuse me? Oh. Um, you can see these big boulders. Let me tell you a story about those. Your, your brain doesn't work at altitude, by the way. And the fellow who de dehydrated himself, and we had to fill him full of water to get him OK again. And of course, when you fill yourself full of all that water, you've got to get up in the middle of the night a couple of times. So he got, he, he got up to go to you know, the toilet. And he hears this crack, rumble, 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 rumble. And he thinks somebody's shooting at him. Remember, I said your brain doesn't work at altitude. So he ducks behind one of these big boulders. And then he hears it again. And he said, wait a minute. It was the Fort Wongler Glacier here, over there. It was calving. And that's what he heard. So pieces of it were falling off. And that's what he had heard, the crack of the ice as it starts. And then the rumble, rumble as it falls down below. When we were camped in the crater, it's anywhere between about zero degrees and 10 below. So that's why I say you wear every piece of clothing you have. You're in a sleeping bag that is rated for 10 below or 20 below. And you make sure that you, keep, you stay as warm as you possibly can. So on the second time that I, we, I went up, I couldn't go up the Western Breach because they had closed it. So we went a different way. And this is called Asabui, is what it's called. Chakula Asabui. It is, you went up this way. Let me show you. You go up here. You want to go up here, and then you're going to go across and go in up the crater that way. So we took a different route. But this is another hand over foot. And I can show you that. You Looking back down, I was took a picture looking back down here. You can see how steep it is. By the way, that's not a road. It's a dry riverbed. Um, but you can see the person right here is right smack up against, and it's called Kiss the Rock. And that's you get that close, and you're trying to find a handhold and a foothold. And there's Victor 
he's up ahead of me there, but you can see what you have to do there. Um, he's just standing there with his one walking stick. And by the way, you have to have them when you're there. Absolutely, you have to have them. Uh, I had never used them before, and he said, well, you're using them this time. And there I am, struggling up. <laughs> this was when the wind was about 60 miles an hour. The porters, we had just come out of camp. And Victor and I, by the way, the second time I was, quote, by myself. In other words, there were no other climbers. Because I had set it out, because I had been through chemotherapy, I didn't know how my endurance would be. So I didn't know if I could do six to eight hours and then four hours. And so I told Victor to lay out our route to be four hours only, like we only go four hours every day. Well, it turned out that I could go, and so we would just bypass one of the camps that we had said we were going to stay in, and we'd go on to the second one. So anyway, um, we came out of camp that morning, and Victor and I left, and we're going up. We had to go around the mountain and come up a different way. And as we came up, there was a camp that's pretty high altitude that was totally destroyed. The wind had come through it that night, and I mean destroyed. It wasn't just knocked down. The tents were absolutely twisted. Um, and we said, well, you know, what's going to be like today? So we went on our way, and with these winds that are going, it was really tough going, very. Um, Victor, at one point, it, it's steep. It's so steep that the switchbacks are so close you can touch the person on the next switchback. So you're going this way and then back, but you know, just only a little bit. I mean, about as much as from the floor to here. Well, we were coming around one edge of the mountain, and you'd think that if you turned the corner, the wind would be at your back, but it wasn't. It was there all the time, blowing you and buffeting you around, buffeting you around. And at one point, <laughs> here I am, Victor's got stuff on his back, but we really are not, um, we aren't equipped to actually stay anywhere on the mountain because the last day you go up to the top and I'm, remember I'm coming a different way now, not through the crater. We're coming around the other way and up the way you would normally go down. We only had enough on our back to keep us that day. The water, food, whatever. We just had what it was for that day. So we're trying to go along here and it's getting pretty bad and at one point Victor, I thought he was going to fall off the mountain, truly. Of course, here I am, you know, five foot nothing, and he's about five nine and rather muscular. And I've, I'm putting my arm out trying to catch him, you know, you know. Thank goodness he caught himself. But that's all we had. So I said to Victor, I, I, we just kind of stood by the side of the path there for a minute. And I said, and Victor looked kind of a little worried. I don't worry until the porters or the guides worry, then I worry. Um, and, and he said, the porters haven't passed us. And I said, that's right. We were going to go camp in the crater after we went to the top. We were going to do the reverse of what I did the first time. Remember, I went into the crater, and then we went to the top? Well, we were coming up the other way. So I was, we were going to go to the top, go back down into the crater and camp there. The porters had not been able to go by us with the camping equipment or the food or anything. They were getting blown off the mountain almost if they tried to come up. They had to, they had to go back down. So I said, OK. Um, what I wanted to do the second time was to camp in the crater and go over to the ash pit, which is another kind of an adventure. And I said, well, I said, Victor, going to the ash pit's kind of the icing on the cake. And then I had to explain to him what that meant. And I said, can we just go get the cake? Meaning, can we just go to the top? And he said, yes, but we're going to have to hurry. We got to the top at 4 PM. Now, remember, you're on the equator where Kilimanjaro is. You have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark all year round. And we're up there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We have two hours to get ourselves back down. You don't want to be on a mountain in the pitch black. You can't see where you're going. 
He had a flashlight. I had a flashlight, but that was it. I mean, we really didn't have much to help us. So we just very carefully picked our way down. And when we got about two thirds of the way to where we needed to go, here came the porters with really big, as they say, torches. They're, that's what the British use as the term for a flashlight. And so they brought us back down because uh, they had been hunting for us, going up to find us. Um, and so they brought us back down to camp. But that was quite an experience. Here you can see that there's snow there. This was a group of ladies who was behind me. I can talk about that a little later. I want to keep going here. I don't want to keep you too long. But there, here you can see when you're at the top, you're above the clouds then. You're above all the weather. And there you can see the sign. And there's what the sign looks like. And there I am at the sign that says the top of Kilimanjaro. And here you can really see, over to the left there, that's where the break is. And we were camped up against this Vertwongler Glacier. One of the things that's at the top is a plaque. And Julius Aneri is considered the father of uh, Tanganyika. Tan it was Tanganyika at one time. Now, of course, it's Tanzania. And what it says is, we the, peop we the people of Tanganyika would like to light a candle and put it on top of Kilimanjaro, which would shine beyond our borders, giving hope where there was despair, love where there was hate, and dignity where before there was only humiliation. I always thought it was a great quote. When you come back down, everybody comes to a camp, same camp, and when you're done, the porters all sing a song to you about you because they've gathered information about you while they're climbing, while you're climbing. And they sing a song to you. So what was Jim doing? Meanwhile, he was out with the natives uh, camping. Um, and if you would like at some point for him to come back and tell you about that, he does a presentation on the animals and the Maasai people of East Africa. So, Asante Sana which means thank you in Swahili, and I appreciate your coming today. Do you have any questions? I mean, you know how old I am now, so you can't ask that one. But people do ask, and if you're afraid to ask, I'll do it for you. What do you do about all the water you're drinking? OK. Well. You, everybody's just very kind to each other. You turn your back on the porters, they turn their back on you. And that's how you take care of all of the urine that you have from drinking all that water. Another question? What motivated you and Victor to do this? You would ask that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Actually, it started when I was five years old. My mother belonged to the Book of the Month Club. Do you all remember that, a lot of you? And she got a book called I Married Adventure, which was about a woman at the beginning of the 20th century who traveled with her husband, who was a photographer. And at that time, of course, we had no movies or anything like that. He would take pictures in places nobody had ever gone. And then he'd come back to the United States and he'd make money by traveling around to movie theaters and giving lectures and showing his pictures. Well, she said, I'm going with you. You think I'm going to stay here? There's no way. And unlike most Victorian women, she said, the heck with this. She got herself a pair of jodhpurs and, and the same gear that men have and boots and taught herself how to shoot because you needed to do that in those days. Um, and off she went with them. So she wrote this book called I Married Adventure. And when my mother, I was looking at it with my mother, and I saw the picture of Kilimanjaro, and I said, can I climb that? Well, my mother, God bless her, she, she didn't want to discourage any of us. And she said, well, maybe when you're a little older. So she never discouraged me. And I had that in my mind that I wanted to do that. Well, of course, it took a number of years and some more money than I had at that point to, to go up Kilimanjaro. So that's where it started. And when Jim and I decided where we were going to go with our a bucket list, I said, well, Africa's the first one. Sorry, but you don't get any choice on that one. Any other questions? What did you do in the bathrooms? 
that was that chemical toilet that they carried with them. And that at night, they would set that up. And that's where you had your bathroom. And where are you going next? Where am I going next? Well, I don't know, at 84, I'm not sure I could do it again. I wanted to do it again, but Jim said, wait a minute, I've waited for you at the bottom of this mountain for 17 days, that's enough. <laughs> Anything else? Were there, um, you had uh, a tour guide and navigator. Yes. Were there multiple companies to keep track of that, or how did you there are There are multiple companies, and you do have to be careful, because some of them really are not as good as others, let me put it that way. Um, some of the porters from other groups that I saw were badly equipped. They were in sandals, believe it or not, um, and short pants. They simply didn't have the money or the outfitter didn't outfit them with proper gear. I had no idea how they slept at night because I had no idea what kind of sleeping gear they had or anything like that. But um, they pretty well cracked down on it now and I think it's better. But um, the way I found my outfitter I saw a, an article in the National Geographic and the people who took all the pictures for that particular article went with a group called Geographic Expeditions out of California. And I said, well, gee, if it's good enough for National Geographic, it's good enough for me. And so I went with Geographic Expeditions. And there are cheaper ways to go. I mean, I, it, it took quite a while to save up enough money to do this. It's not a cheap thing to do. Any other questions? How old were you when you took your first trip out of the country? I was 60 years old. The second time I was almost 70. Yes? What was the trip? Uh, it was kind of about the cost. I'd have to think about that for a minute. The actual, you see you have to get, you have to get kind of a license to do it to, for, to start with. Um, and that costs anywhere between two and three thousand, I believe. But by the time I was done with my outfitter and everything, I think it was closer to twenty. I'd have to look really at my, to, to be honest with you, I'm guessing at that now, so forgive me if I've exaggerated a bit, but I suspect it's even that today. Um, it's not cheap to get there. It takes. Even to get to East Africa takes you two days. And you, because you have to stay over at either Heathrow or at Frankfurt. And what we would do is we would take an, a room there to sleep because you might have eight or nine hour layover. And so we would stay in a room there so we weren't so exhausted when we got there. And then when you get there, you better wait another day just to, to um, acclimate to where you are, number one, and secondly, to to uh, not be exhausted. And so when you're coming back, it's the same, same thing. You're, you're about two days to come back. Day and a half, two days to come back. Yes? Obviously, you went in a group. You, were, you did a private um, tour, right? I'm sorry? You were not in a group. I was the first time. There were three of us. But the second time? The second time, I was m myself and the porters. Think about this. There's a critical mass that you kind of have to have, even if you're just a single person. You have to have a guide, but you have to have a backup guide. You have to have the porters to carry, you have to carry a propane, propane tank and a stove. You have to carry the food. So I had 10 people all together just supporting me. Now, 10 people can support probably three to five people. But you have to have all of that gear, whether you're one person or five people. So that's what you're paying for, and that's why it's so expensive. Any other questions? In all your travels, how many countries did you go to? Jim just asked me that. What was it, 42? 42 so far. So far. So far. I think we're sticking pretty much to the US these days. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Oh, yes, another question. The second time I went, we actually spent five weeks 
in Africa. And we went to Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, Zimbabwe. South Africa. What else? Cape Town. Sorry? Cape Town. Cape Town. Oh, I said South okay. Africa. Okay. There, I'm trying to think what else. There are two other countries in between. Um, Lake Victoria, oh, excuse me, the Victoria Falls, we were there. Uh, we went to Botswana for the elephants because they have really incredible. By the way, I have to tell you something if you are on the internet. You might want to look at a YouTube called The Elephant, Elephants Who Came to Dinner. It is fascinating. I won't tell you about it. You go, you go look at it. It is incredible. Any other questions? Okay, thank might, you so much. Might add that in the time that we spent six weeks there, we were in 11 different airplanes because you, you can't go from one place to the other very easily in the Jeep. So we'd fly in little <coughs> planes that would just hold Kathy, myself, and the pilot. And that was always an experience in itself. And guess where we, I sat? One time we, one time we had to uh, buzz the uh, landing field because the herd of elephants were on. The, uh, <laughs> They don't move. They like to lick at the dust because of the salt. And normally the pilot said that uh, buzzing it would scare them away. It would for any other animal, but not the elephant. So we had to go out of our way and land someplace else. There's something I wanted to add to that, Jim, before you start talking about the airplanes. Can't remember. Hold on. Senior moment. Might add that. Uh, when Kathy came down the first time, the porters and everybody else uh, called her Bibi, which is a f term of endearment for an older woman. The second time she came down, they said, you are now Bibi Chuma. And Kathy was kind of discouraged that all of a sudden her name is being changed. And she said, what is Chuma? And the, and the guy said, Iron Lady. You are now our Iron Lady. So my license plate, if you pass it in the parking lot, is BB Chuma. Uh, Kathy, Kathy, um, yeah. just in um, celebration of Active Aging Week, what do you intend to um, to remain active oh today? <laughs> and what is what do you dream of your next adventure? I want to brag about one thing, because I don't like to. I can do twenty pushups. <laughs> Jim and I go to our fitness club. We live at Willow Valley, by the way. Um, we go to the fitness club between three, I'd say three times a week. And we walk when we're not there, or we have some equipment in our home that we use if we don't go there, if it's really bad weather and I don't feel like going out there, going out to get there. Um, we just try to do anything we can. Um, and, uh, you know, if you don't keep moving, you can't keep moving, if you know what I mean. And I, I, I've been diagnosed as severely arthritic, so I understand being in pain all the time, but if you don't move, you can't move. About, about uh, 10 years ago, Kathy was asked to speak at a Relay for Life uh, event in New Jersey. And there were gonna be about 7,000 people there. And Kathy made a very good point. She said, you folks maybe can't climb Kilimanjaro, but maybe you can walk around your block once, and then twice around later on. Make that your Kilimanjaro. Not everybody can climb. We've climbed Machu Picchu in Peru. Not everybody can do that. So uh, you have to fit the ex exercise to your environment and yourself. When we're away on vacation or tra traveling, Sometimes we don't get a chance to really work out. We'll come back home after being t gone two or three weeks and it's like starting all over again, oh, particularly at my age and at Kathy's age. 93 is just uh, some of the parts like an automobile wearing out. You, know, you can't replace them that easily. Is there anything that you haven't done that you want to do? <laughs> yeah, go up the third time. <laughs> One trip. I don't think I could do it now, Tom. One trip uh, we recommend is the Galapagos. If you haven't been there, that was an outstanding 
we climbed Machu Picchu and then went on over to the Galapagos and spent a week there and that was just unbelievable. But of all the places we've been, I take East Africa. Oh, yeah. The people, the scenery, the animals. If I'm asked to, uh, to come back there and, and give you the second part of this program, I'll show you a picture of a half a million animals in one picture. The migration, the super eight migration in Kenya and uh, Tanzania. Tanzania, where there's at least a million animals on the move constantly, 24 hours, seven days. And it's amazing, the ground is just in a distance just black with antelope or zebra, whatever. There's one of the camps that we went to that followed the herds. And when, when you do that, they're so environmentally conscious there that when you pick up the camp and move, you may not leave it. You have to leave it exactly the way you found it. And believe me, when they do that, you can't even tell we were there. It's amazing. But they're very, very conscious uh, of this migration. It's the largest animal migration in the world. And it's, they depend on tourism for people to come there. And so they are trying to preserve the animals. As you may know, the, even the lions are under threat now. Um, there's been reasons for that, but that's being, that's being changed. Um, so, you know, they're very, most of the countries that depend on tourism really are very, very much into protecting their environment. Ain't nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints. You got it. It's exactly right. You don't even leave that, by the way. You can't find a footprint. What? Really, I stood on the edge of what they had just cleaned. You couldn't, you couldn't tell where it even had a fire. Uh -uh. It was all buried and raked over and, you know, if anything had to be planted back in, they planted it back in. It was amazing. Our favorite way of camping is called fly tent or fly camp. And this is an old English way that uh, the hunters used to go, but you get a four sticks about this tall, wrap mosquito netting across the top and the bottom, put your sleeping bag inside, and go to bed. And you're looking up here to a million stars. One night, Cassie and I were awakened by two prides of lions, one about a half mile that way and one about a half mile this way. And they were hoofing, that's what it's called, hoofing back and forth. And it was the most beautiful sound you'd ever hear in your life. We woke up the next morning, our guide said, ooh, you lucky. And we said, what's the matter? He said, hippo come through right here, stop by your tent. Hippos are blind pretty much, they go by smell. And they put, run with their head down. And all of a sudden this hippo looked up and there was our tent right there and he went around it. He says, but I was watching. I had one foot out. And that's the term that they use over there instead of we say sleeping. One eye open. One eye open, one foot out. He said, I, I watch. And that's what you pay the money for. Yeah. Again, me. again, he was. We, we, we can tell you a lot of stories, of close yeah. calls. We had, I think, four close calls With out elephants. of the 20-some years we've been doing it, and all of them involved elephants. Yep. Elephants are absolutely magnificent, unbelievable animals, but un, unreliable, and you never know what's going to happen. And we had very, four very close calls with elephants. And, uh, We'll tell you about them if we come back. Okay. Thank you. All.